some of the broader science behind the why um, and share some of the curriculum that high school students are now using and also give you some really inspiring cool examples of uh, composting in our area. This is a picture of this year's ECOS officers. I'm so proud of them. They've accomplished so very much. We're missing one of them, but there's four of them. And the membership of the ECOS club, this is from a couple years ago. Got a very active club at the high school. I'd like to begin with a little bit about the world that these kids are inheriting from us. The current state of the earth and also humans' place in the history of earth. That will give us a good context. This is a photo of Earth taken by NASA's Voyager 1. It's the first ever portrait of our solar system. Okay, okay well, all right. Um, and this was taken in 1990. And you can see the little tiny dot, and that is us. Uh, Carl Sagan, who was a member of the Voyager's imaging team, remarked, this is us. On it, everyone you love, everyone you know, everyone you have ever heard of, every human being who ever was, lived out their lives here. A little closer, the Earth taken from the moon, 1968, and even closer. What an incredible, incredible planet we live on. The question is now, how is the Earth doing? If we were to give Earth a checkup like you would see your doctor, for instance, like you might check into your circulatory system, your digestive system, respiratory, etc., what would it look like for Earth? And what of humankind and its relationship to the health of the planet? For this type of data, I'm looking to the Stockholm Resilience Center in Sweden. They're a globally recognized think tank of sustainability scientists. Uh, ranked very high by the University of Pennsylvania. They have an organization that ranks environmental think tanks there. What do they have to say about the Earth and the health of Earth and its relation to humankind? First, I'd like to put humankind in perspective of the Earth. Basically, the Earth is 4.5 billion years old. And humans, we've only been in existence for a very small fraction of that history history, 160,000 years for humans. That's it, a little tiny dot of time. In this graph, this is basically um, a measure of climate over time, over most of the history of humankind on the planet Earth. And it's climate change. And as you can see, for most of human history, which happens to be a time period when we're hunter-gatherers, you see it's up, down, up, down, up, down very unfavorable conditions for humans. And that went on for such a long time. <coughs> then suddenly, if you look in the far right at the top, you see a small period of stability, climate-wise. Um, some people call it a period of grace. It is a time period, geologically speaking, called the Holocene. Um, and this has been going on for the last 11,700 years on our planet. It's just a period of remarkable climate stability, and we're very fortunate because during this time, humans have really come of age. They've done so much on this planet and with all their activity, at the end of that Holocene period, we are now finding our climate conditions are, are changing. So we are now leaving the period of the Holocene, and we are going into a new period of time called the Anthropocene. It's a new epoch geologically speaking, where the Earth is influenced by human activity. What do I mean by human activity? These are some of the types of things that humankind has been involved in on the planet. And yes, a lot of it started at the time of the Industrial Revolution, but the, the greatest increase in time was the great acceleration, scientists have found, which is around the 1950s. These are all different endeavors of human uh, activity, uh, including population growth, fertilizer consumption, gross um, domestic product, use of telephones, vehicles, tourism, water use, et cetera, et cetera. There's even a McDonald's restaurant there, I think. And how is it all this human activity reflected in the systems of Earth? As you can see, 
there is a direct correlation with some of the responses of Earth, biophysically speaking. You can see atmospheric CO2 go up, ozone depletion, ocean ecosystem exploitation, nitrogen cycles disrupted, biodiversity loss. All of this can be really summarized in an incredible video we don't have time for today, but it's called Welcome to the Anthropocene, and it was shown at the United Nations to give basically a checkup of Earth. Um, and it's something you all should see. I encourage you to check it out. But for now, we have a visual that encompasses that very well. And it, again, it's the, from the Stockholm Resilience Center. So these are sustainability scientists that are providing this. This is called the Planetary Boundaries Framework. Um, and basically, it's showing different functions of humankind on planet Earth. And you'll see a green uh, circle in the middle, and that is considered the safe operating space for humanity. That would be considered the time of the Holocene when all the conditions are perfect for human beings. And it's a little, little unsettling to see that we've surpassed some of the, the boundaries that are considered safe for humankind here. Um, and, of course, this is data from human beings. We're still learning so much, but it's, it's a little bit jarring um, to see that. And you can learn a lot more about it. I'm not a scientist, but uh, I enjoyed a course about it, and it's very compelling visually. So taking a look at a couple of the things, I'm not going to go over all of this, but if you look at the very top, you'll see the climate change um, boundary. Uh, as you, you, a lot of this is publicized. People are aware of this. Um, it's from use of fossil fuels and deforestation, et cetera. We should be at around 350 parts per million CO2 right now. We're at 406, according to NOAA. Here in Maine, we have different impacts of global warming, which we know about. Um, negative impacts to tourism, loss of maple syrup, uh, season uh, production, species loss, coastal flooding, fluctuations in temperature. And there are many solutions, uh, renewable energy, et cetera, electric cars, carpooling, public transport. And sure enough, composting is considered a wonderful uh, thing that you can do to help with this situation because compost acts as a carbon sink. So that's something to think about. Here's our compost. Um, another category on the diagram is novel entities up on the right. That is basically synthetic substances, many toxic in nature like pesticides and GMOs. That is not yet quantifiable and the scientists are currently working on it. But as far as pesticides, this is a picture of pesticides being used in a rice patties. Um, Compost, as we'll find out, lessens your need for pesticide use. So that's another great reason to think about composting. Another category is biosphere integrity. That means biodiversity loss and species loss. This is a red list of species that are endangered or extinct. Um, and also, this is a picture of um, marine ecosystems impacted. Finally, we have a photo of a worker in South China who is hand pollinating trees because of the loss of bees in the area due to pesticides. Uh, let's see, the next area is biogeochemical flows, namely phosphorus and nitrogen. Um, this shows the nitrogen cycle, uh, which in nature can be very balanced. Contributors are atmospheric uh, nitrogen and manures, et cetera. You'll learn a lot about this probably soon. <laughs> um, but right now it's out of balance because nitrogen is used for fertilizer, but it's such a large scale. We're basically taking nitrogen from the atmosphere now and converting it to fertilizer on just an incredible scale, which is very challenging for the Earth to absorb, and it does run off into our waterways. Um, the same for phosphorus cycle. Whoops, did I miss a slide there? Uh, let's see. I'm going back, sorry. <laughs> All right, the phosphorus cycle can be in balance in nature, and it shows some of the ways it is through bacteria, fungi, 
Um, and interesting how it's incorporated into sedimentary rock, the flow of the phosphorus throughout the cycle. Animal feces and tissue and urine, plants do their part, and it can all be in balance. But because we need more fertilizers to feed our large populations, we're starting to do mining of phosphorus, which is a finite situation in that regard. And all this extra fertilizer is going, again, into our waterways. Once again, compost to the rescue, because compost is a way that we can avoid using these types of fertilizers. So back to our planetary boundaries. How did we arrive here? There's a number of things that happened we just talked about, but probably the biggest thing is this, none of these, one of these things is a bad thing per se, but the sheer scale, complexity, and speed from the 1950s um, and around that time period on is really what's making it hard for the Earth to absorb all these things. Um, when you look at the, the, the things in red, <laughs> um, these are basically the evolution of humankind here, learning about how to live on this planet. If you look at those things, knowledge, wisdom, lack of these things, hum, um, grasp of responsibilities, consequences, I'm curious to find out when you think of a human being growing from a child to a teen to an adult to an elder, can you guess sort of what category you might put that in? What type of developmental stage would you, would you guess that that person would be at? Does anyone have a wager? What? I'm thinking teenager, teenager. And that's actually been discussed um, sociologically that humankind may be in the phase of their teen years uh, here on Earth, and we have some growing up to do. Um, but we're learning a lot more. While there is no evil master plan of ecological <coughs> destruction in the story and little conscious intent to destroy communities and life ways or ruin the climate, nonetheless, we all are part of an overarching system that effectively does damage by way of countless negative cumulative failures of conscience and that are easily brushed aside in the process of maximizing profits or by getting through the routines of our day. And that is a quote from Susan Murphy, a Zen teacher. So it's at times like this that I feel like we could probably use a little help from a friend. I don't know if any of you know Matt Foley, but um, just so that we all don't end up in a van down by the river, there are some new and exciting ways that we can look at the planet and we can grow up and have fun at the same time. And that is by looking at ecological frameworks. As an example, this is one of the frameworks that are used in one of the high school kids' textbooks. Um, it's an iceberg model, and you know it, how an iceberg works. You really just see what's at the top. You don't see what's underneath. Um, but far at the bottom, you see something called worldviews. Worldviews are something we all have, but don't necessarily think of. It's basically a set of assumptions about how the world and how we fit into the world. What should we do? Where are we headed? What is true and false? All great civilizations are built on worldviews. For instance, slavery was built on a worldview of racial superiority and applied to sustain economic emergence of the Western world. The West has a worldview based on individual liberties and scientific rationalism, which gave rise to human rights, innovation, and capitalism. So you can see how these things promote um, the actions that you see from day to day. So what kind of exciting new visions and organizations and opportunities could possibly arise if we were to consider a new type of worldview, an ecological worldview, where the well-being of Earth and humankind was one? There are so many exciting things happening now, and I'm learning a lot about them through my kids at the high school. It's too long to go through this list, but you're going to see composting a few times in some of these categories. I'm going to go on to give you a little more detail about some of these things. 
So this is in economics, for instance. What happens when you adopt an ecological worldview? You may switch you, um, from a triple bottom line. Well, first of all, the bottom line would be normally measuring profit and return of investment. But now a triple bottom line includes ecological and social dimensions. And then let's take it a step further. Let's put society and the economy within the planet's ability to sustain us. What would that look like? How would our lives be? This is one of my very favorite books on a emerging field of spiritual ecology, and I think it's something we all really all could use as we get through the state of the Anthropocene. There's some fantastic um, quotes, and I have this book out in the hall if anyone is interested in some of the things. They're very profound, very uplifting, and very exciting. This is another person who has some incredible frameworks for the future. Um, his philosophy, this is Andreas Edwards, um, is promoting inner transformation to reflect outer transformation. So inner landscapes reflecting outer. He has a number of different, very intriguing frameworks for this that we can all adopt. Um, and also this book is out for you to take a look at. We also have the United Nations. They are working on sustainability development goals, which reflect an ecological worldview. We have many authors. This is uh, the story of stuff, which is an eye opener <coughs> into the origin and life cycle of the things we buy. A book called The Upcycle, which is a book on ecological design, which many of you know is cradle to cradle design. Also, there's advances in uh, soil biology. Uh, we're learning now the value of bacteria and fungus in the, in the soil. A fantastic uh, way to learn more about that is a, a wonderful um, movie called Symphony of the Soil, which showcases the living soil. And they have two other uh, parts of that which are just out of this world. If you want to get excited about composting and the living soil, this is for you. Um, and then here in our own backyard, we have a lot of uh, wonderful initiatives that reflect an ecological worldview. This is a grassroots organization called Citizens for Green Scarborough, which arose from a mother's concerns for the safety over pesticides with her children. And from that, we uh, put together a town policy here in Scarborough of limiting pesticides on town and school properties. And from that arose a town committee overseeing that. This is very exciting uh, as we follow the progression in South Portland and Portland as they create ordinances of the same. Permaculture is one of my very favorites. It's a form of organic gardening, uh, which I'd love you to learn more about. It's another example of an ecological framework. I think the best thing for me to do is to take you on a very quick virtual tour of a permablitz, which is a gathering of permaculture people. And with permaculture, as with the organic gardening, again, it all starts with incredible soil, living soil, compost. So this particular permablitz was at an apiary, for, so there would be bees on the property here in Portland. So basically what happens is permaculture designers gather and make a plan for the property to transform it to reflect ecological perspective. The information is put on the meetup site and people see that and find the date and gather together. They arrive at the site. This is all the uh, volunteers and members come to the site gather together, talk about what you're about to do on the site, share food, sort of like an Amish barn raising, but transforming a property to reflect ecology, ecological design. Then all the people split up into different groups, each group with a leader who knows how to teach it, and you learn from them. This is one of the groups. This is a group planting swales of comfrey, uh, Machu Picchu style, sort of. The comfrey is a nitrogen fixer, so there you go. Uh, and bees love comfrey. This is a hugel, which is a uh, basically a form of composting using logs. And of course, there's always animals on the property with permaculture because you need a closed loop system to create your composting. And then here we have the mulch beds that we're, we're uh, redoing for this year using compost. It's very exciting. 
so back to the kids. So the kids at the high school are doing one full year of environmental science this year. The book on the top, the black one, is what they'll be using this fall. And as you can see, they're learning about soil science, overuse of fertilizer, and of course, how to compost. So my environmental club kids have been, had already been doing a lot of wonderful things, um, different initiatives, different changes, and we've been using this framework to help us transition to new things. Um, and I always see my kids as the bridgers and also the creators of new systems. And as they do that, they're pulling us all forward to where we really need to be. This model can be used to ch make a change, of course, for things like peak oil, uh, avoiding the conventional waste stream, for instance, um, getting away from monocultures, uh, things like that, and changing course for new and exciting pathways. This is the kids doing their weekly <coughs> recycling. This is the ki basically the kids put together a presentation for the town council on why they wanted to compost and the reasons that people should compost. They put together collaborations at their school. And this is a picture of them doing an educational campaign, making posters. Some really good posters here that they've done. And then basically they set up four stations in their cafeteria and they have Garbage to Gardens as their, their contractor. Um, it was a little bumpy. There were a lot of issues. It was a challenge, but we all worked together. And sure enough, this pilot program at the high school was expanded to all the Scarborough schools. We're very excited. We're very proud. And of course, the compost that we get from Garbage to Gardens goes to our Life Skills Courtyard for raising vegetables. Here's the kids. This year they won one of the Eco Main Awards. I'm so very proud of them for all the different things that they've done to help the planet. So basically my takeaway is for you, um, the important thing is to know that you, the earth, its systems and all living things are one. How will that help you change your lives? And what legacy will we leave these children? And will that include composting? Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Good evening. My name is Mark King. I work for the Department of Environmental Protection in the Sustainability Division, and I really appreciate the invitation to come tonight and, and speak to you folks. What I want to talk to you a little bit about is how to set up composting in your backyard, and we'll go through a little bit of the biology so you can understand sort of how things work. First, first question you have to ask yourself is why do people want to compost? And one of the things that pops up right away is that it is the right thing to do. Two years ago, we, we held composting workshops throughout the state, and we met various audiences, and we, we learned a lot of things. And what we learned was that people do want to do the right thing, but what they want to do is they want to follow the right process. And what we're learning is that if you look at this, this hierarchy up here, this was designed by the EPA, you see the very top is called source reduction, and that means that you don't generate any waste in the first place. You buy smart, you cook just what you need, you don't cook too much. And then the next stage is feed hungry people. If you do make a mistake and cook too much, let's get that food to people that are going to consume it. It's, it shouldn't go in the ground, it should go to people. And then if it can't feed people, then let's feed animals. So what we've started to do this year is we're going to push that in, in a great way. We're going to go around the state and we're going to talk about these three rungs of the hierarchy and try to really get an impact out of that. Once people do all they can do at those levels, then we'll talk about composting, we'll talk about digestion, we'll talk about the rest of the steps, but we want to just not generate it in the first place. But if you do, why do you compost? Well, first and foremost, it adds organic matter to your soil. 
our soils are depleted in organic matter. And what that means is they can't hold on to nutrients when nutrients are applied. You put fertilizer on your soils, it gets soaked down into the column and doesn't stay in the root system where it can do some work. So organic matter is really important. It also increases water holding capacity. Now, we're not like California, who has a, probably the last three years have been the worst drought they've seen in 100 years, but we could be with global warming. And what compost does is it adds the ability of your soil to hold on to water so you don't get drought conditions. But what else it does is it breaks up tough soil. If you have heavy clay soils, it opens them up and allows tilt. It allows the roots to penetrate. It allows water to drain. So it's a really great kind of, well, I work as a paramedic as one of my side jobs, and I call it a defibrillator for your soil, like when you shock somebody back to life. And then we also have enhanced microbial activity, and with that comes alive in the soil, but also disease suppression. We're finding that soils used on crops that are prone to getting diseases like potatoes, the compost actually will suppress those diseases and help them to be healthy and stronger. So it's a very exciting science that's coming forward. So all these things make composting a really valuable thing. So what is it? Well, it's a biological process. And we all talk about the little tiny microorganisms that you can't see that do most of the work. But it's really everything. It's the big bugs. It's some of the animals that break up the food particles. So it starts out with what we call the macroscopic, the ones you can see. And then it gets down into the ones that you can't see without a microscope. And so we have both levels. But it is a biological process that takes raw organic materials, any material that was once alive, and it converts it into a very stable, strong compound, which is a benefit for our soil. So the compost community, as I said, has macroscopic and microscopic organisms. And uh, if you take a look, this is kind of how they do the work. We start out with the big bugs that kind of break things into little particles. But if you chew up a piece of wood, it's still pretty strong. So the fungi come in and they break down the compound fibers in the wood and then along come the actinomyocetes and the other microorganisms to break it down even further. So it's a whole cascade of organisms that help the composting process. So what does it take to make it work? Well, we have to have a good recipe. We have to have a good mix. And we'll talk about this thing called the C-Dan ratio. It's really quite simple. We have to have oxygen. We have to have moisture because moisture is where the microbes live the ones that do most of the work. So if you don't have moisture, you don't have microbes. pH, to a certain extent, can affect things. I, I know that down in this area, you guys had a real bad smell from a compost site last year. A lot of people were affected by it. And what happens is that when the pH of the pile is really, really low, really acidic, volatile organic acids are released. And they're very smelly, and they can travel for miles and miles and miles. So just adjusting the pH is often enough to take care of the odor problem. And then particle size. So let's take a look at how these interact. So the C-Den ratio is basically nothing more than the carbon to nitrogen value. The way to think about it is the carbon is the food source that the microbes use. The nitrogen is what the microbes use to replace themselves and create more microbes. They form proteins and amino acids from it. Okay? Carbon would be things like sawdust, shavings, leaves, Nitrogen are food scraps, lobster bodies, anything that's really kind of gross that you want to get rid of, the putrescible, smelly stuff, that's all nitrogen because it really breaks down very quickly. So if your carbon to nitrogen ratio is too low, meaning that you have more nitrogen than carbon, you get smells and you get really poor composting. If it's too high, it doesn't move at all. There's just not enough nitrogen to create microbes, so you just don't get good reproduction. So we want a ratio of around 20 to 30 to 1. So carbon feedstocks, as I mentioned, include leaves, wood shavings, uh, paper, although shredded paper by itself is not a good thing because when it gets wet, it compresses, and then you don't have any oxygen, and without oxygen, you get odor. So it's a very, it's a very complicated kind of cycle, but it's very simple when you think about it. Nitrogen sources include animal manures, food scraps, uh, lawn, trimmings, fish, garden clippings. Here's, here's really the take home message. Oxygen and moisture are two sides of the same coin. If you don't have enough moisture, you don't have enough microbes. But if you have too much moisture, all the available air spaces in the pile are full. 
so oxygen can't get to the microbes. The microbes need oxygen in order to do their job. So the way that we have excellent amounts of oxygen is by making sure that we have no more than 55% moisture in the pile. How do I figure that out? I grab a handful of the pile and I give it a squeeze. If water comes shooting out of my knuckles, it's too wet. If I open my hand and I got a clump of moist stuff, it's perfect. If I open my hand and it all sprinkles down, then it's too dry. It's not rocket science. It works really super well. But if you start to get towards the low end of oxygen, you're going to have lots of odor and you're going to have poor microbial activity. So we always try to make it perfect oxygen, perfect moisture. So we have two types of organisms. We have aerobes and anaerobes. Aerobes use oxygen. They're my favorite because they don't produce odors. Anaerobes do not use oxygen and they stink. But occasionally they can use oxygen. So they can be good guys if the pile is fixed. And the way that happens is if I have a smelly pile, I lift it up, I fluff it up, I let air into it, and all of a sudden those anaerobes switch to oxygen and then we start getting more of the good guys. So there's always a way to fix a problem. So nothing in composting cannot be fixed if it's broken. So oxygen, uh, another thing to remember is that we use 5% oxygen in our bodies. We breathe in 20%, we give off 16. That's why when you give mouth to mouth to someone, they're able to come to life because you're still giving them some oxygen. Piles are the same way, they need just 5%. Okay? If they get too little, they just slow down. But with oxygen, they do a phenomenal job. So the way that I can tell that things are working well in my pile is I take temperatures because the temperatures are a reflection of the microbial metabolism. The hotter the thermometer gets, the more microbes I have working. The more microbes I have working, the more I know that my pile, oxygen, and moisture are just about right. Do I still grab it and get a squeeze test? Sure, but when it's 160, I wear a glove because okay, it can be pretty warm. So what we do as we're going through the life of a compost pile is we start out with our initial mix. Slowly it comes to temperature as more and more microbes are being formed. That first phase under 110 degrees is called your mesophilic. That takes about a week and then all of a sudden it bumps up to 130, 140. That's your thermophilic. Those are the organisms that do the best work of breaking compost down. And then after you do four to six weeks of that, we let it sit for two months in what's called curing. So it looks something like this. That part in the middle is where I want to be because that's going to kill any diseases that might be in the compost and it's going to kill weed seeds. There's nothing worse than giving compost to someone to put in their front yard and not pop tomato plants. You know, they're like, what's going on? So that kills all those seeds. It's a good thing. As I mentioned before, 50 to 65% moisture is ideal. That's where the microbes live and we want that. But this is kind of what I want you to think about when you think about a compost pile. If I mix it well and I have the right moisture and I have the right recipe, I'm going to end up with something like this. And what you're going to see is this free air space right here is where oxygen is getting into the pile. This is where the water is and this is where my carbon and nitrogen are. So on the edges are where the microbes do their work. Now think about this. They don't move. They stay in one place. So after they feed for a bit, how do I make sure they get more opportunity to feed other places. I turn it. And every time you turn it, you remix it and you redistribute those microbes. So every time we turn it, we make the pile fresh and new again. And that's the whole process, is that we've got to keep prodding it to keep things going in the right direction. So particle size is wicked important too. The, this upper left here, that's awesome for absorbing juice. If I've got leachate and gooey stuff, that, that absorbs it all really well but air can't flow through that. Over here is awesome for airflow and structure. It's not, the pile's gonna stay nice and tall, but microbes can't live in that because it doesn't hold on to water. So what we want is a combination of the two. We're gonna have good airflow, good moisture holding, and it's the ideal place for the microbes to live. So we look for this kind of mixture of particle size. This is really the, where the rubber hits the road. This is a pile that we did in 2006, and there are poultry inside there, about 640. What I want to show you is that if you look on the sides of the pile, you can see those white spots. That's drying from air being sucked through the pile. 
right in the dead center is moist and hotter than heck. It's about 170 degrees. And what's happening is that pile sucking air through to feed oxygen to that core. That core is cooking because it's perfect. And it's shooting out through the top. We call that the chimney. And what you end up with is a perfect pile. Now, after a period of time, that temperature will start to decline. When that happens, then I know it's time to turn it. And that's as simple as composting is. So what system should you use? This is by far my favorite. This is lobster trap wire. It's 14 feet long, 4 foot tall, form it into a cylinder. Up to the very top it holds one cubic yard. That is the minimum size you need. These earth machines, they're a little too small. So in the wintertime they freeze. These bins, we actually did it at UNE uh, a winter study, and we had hot temperatures from December through March of the following year. So one cubic yard is ideal. This is an example of what happens. Look at everything snow covered, but that pile's still cooking. We've got the right mass. Now you can do the bin system. This is three, th three one cubic yard bins. <coughs> but once again, if you do that, every time you put stuff around it, you decrease the amount of air that's flowing to it. So that becomes a problem. This is another type of bin system. As long as you're turning it a lot, you can get away with less aeration. But it just means you've got to pay more attention to it. A lot of folks want to set the bin up and forget about it. This is kind of co cool too. This is basically looking at, this is a tumbler. This is a, a ball that if you have hyperkinetic children that need something to do, you put compost in, they kick it around the yard and you know it's all good. And this is what I have at home. This works really well and it's a, it's a barrel tumbler. You tumble it. All these work well. They're not a cubic yard, but you're constantly agitating them so you overcome that mass. <coughs> uh, this is just a shot of the tumbler again. And this is, this is the easiest. This is a five yard pile that they're turning with a pitchfork or a little garden tractor. This works the best, but it's not the prettiest. People want aesthetic things. This would not look good in your backyard. People would be like, oh, that's kind of gross. Whereas a nice bin is very contained and dainty and looks really sweet. So these are the tools that you need. You have a spade fork over here, which is a pitch fork that's turbocharged. You've got a wing digger, which you shove it in, and when you pull it out, the arms extend and they rip holes in it. So, you know, whatever it takes to get it agitated. So, so really now, kind of getting, getting to the grit here, where do you get started? First thing that you want to do is you want to start collecting your scraps at home. Figure out what you want, how much you need, and then once a week, bring it out to your pile and get it mixed into the bin. Now, in a lot of school systems, they get data out of this. They weigh it. They draw graphs of the temperatures. And whatever teachers want, I'll generate curriculum for them because I want kids to get into this because kids make adults or grow into adults that will do this. So this is just showing how you collect it in the buckets, you know, and, and uh, basically just maintaining your bin. And then you ask yourself, well, when is it finished? And it's finished when the material is ready to be used. If you're going to put it on a flower bed that you're, that you're just turning over in the spring, it's okay if it's a little hot because it's going to energize the soil. If you're going to grow petunias in it, you want to make sure that it's been cured for a long time so there's no activity left in it. It should be the same temperature as the ambient, the outside temperature. You should be able to, when you smell it, you just smell dirt. I had, a, I had an old-time composter once told me, he said, he goes, I know when compost is ready because it smells like inert dirt. It took me a long time to figure out. I mean, he's a pretty smart guy. And I was like, inert dirt? What the heck is he talking about? After about a year, it finally dawned on me that it doesn't smell like anything. And that was pretty cool. And then, so basically, the last slide I have here is, how do we get started? And I would tell you that if you guys want to do it in this community, we hold an open house. We hold a Saturday at the transfer station, or we, or we hold a Saturday here. And we talk about it. We get people fired up. We get them home. We, we get them set up. And then if they run into trouble, they call me. And I'll come down and help them out. And I've also got a compatriot that works at the Kanko office in Portland who loves to come and help people too. So this is not rocket science. It's, it's a cool thing to do. It reduces the amount of weight in your waste stream. And it makes you feel really good when you use it to grow something. I, I compost at home. We grow vegetables with the compost we make. It's really awesome. So it's just, it's got to be something that you want to do, though. I can't make you compost. I can only nurture you along as you want to compost. So that's all I got. Okay, let me get.
get Marcus up here. Thank you, Marcus. Absolutely, brother. Appreciate it. One-handed, so. I'm going to take care of you, my man. <laughs> All right, so where are you? Where did I put you? We're in sort of verbal compost. Yep, yep, there you go. Okay. All right. And then slideshow from beginning. I've just been using the arrow there. Yeah, you right on. All right. So first I want to thank the Conservation Commission for giving me the opportunity to share my passion with all of you. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I've got a worm bin here. If after I give my talk and we're all finished with the Q&A, people want to come up and check it out, feel free. Um, we can poke around, dig around, answer more questions. I usually give an hour-long presentation for, for this talk, so for me to jam it into 20 minutes is a bit of a challenge. Um, we don't want to be here all night, though. But I'm happy to answer questions. My contact information is on the back of the handout. If you have questions or concerns, feel free to get in touch with me, phone or email. Um, introduction to vermicomposting. Let me start by saying I'm going to say a lot of what Mark just said. Um, vermicomposting, is, it really complements outdoor composting. It's related to outdoor composting, but it's not hot composting, what Mark just talked about. And so why vermicomposting? What's the reason? Why would you do it? Um, vermicomposting allows people to compost indoors. So if you either don't want to go all the way out to your outdoor compost pile or don't, perhaps you live in an apartment or a condo association that doesn't allow outdoor compost piles, you can still compost. And in fact, you can do it indoors using worms. So it's uh, very related to outdoor composting, hot composting that Mark talked about, but it's not exactly the same thing, and I'll, I'll highlight some of the differences. So what do you need to get started? Really, you need four things. You need worms, obviously. Wouldn't be vermicomposting if you didn't have worms. Um, you need a worm bin, something to house the worms in. Bedding, that is something that's organic, a shredded material to fluff, as Mark mentioned. You need to make it lighter. Um, and then food scraps, that's the point here. We're reducing things that we you know, put in the waste stream. Instead, we're diverting it into our worm bin. Um, as far as the worms, I recommend red, red wigglers, Icinia fetidia. Um, they have a few traits or habits or features that allow them to live in a worm bin quite happily, and I'll talk more about some of those later. Um, as far as the bin, any style works. Um, this, what you see here, is kind of my keep it simple stupid method of doing it. Um, you don't have to buy something for 130 bucks made in China from Amazon. You certainly can. Those work perfectly well. But this is something most people can look at this and say, oh gosh, I can make that. It'll take me about 10 minutes and probably from things I already have around the house. As far as bedding, um, shredded newspaper. Mark mentioned some, some of the things about shredded newspaper. Um, as far as newspaper, you can use any organic material, something to kind of fluff up the, the soil. I use just shredded newspaper. Um, you don't want to use crosscut. As Mark mentioned, it'll form a mat once it gets wet. But if you make it nice and long, obviously it doesn't get too wet. Um, you don't have to use newspaper. You can use office paper, um, cocoa core, peat moss. They all work really well. Um, that's for bedding. And the last thing is your food scraps. And this is the same things that would go in your outdoor compost pile, um, with a few exceptions. So on the left-hand side, we have things that do go in your bin. So cores, husks, peels, rind, coffee, um, coffee, the coffee itself, the coffee filter, tea bags, eggshells. I mentioned newspaper, things like that. All that can go in your worm bin. Things that could go in your outdoor bin that really should not go in your indoor bin are things like meat, fish, bone, dairy products, vegetable oil, pet waste, salty food. Um, and then the last two are kind of my personal recommendations, dirt from outside and plastic. Plastic won't break down. Dirt from outside might carry insect eggs and you'd have bugs in your bin. If that doesn't matter to you, feel free, go for it. Likewise, if you don't have little kids, who um, would go into your worm bin, you could put pet waste in there in small quantities. It's not going to bother the worms. But for my, for my bins, I never put any pet waste in there. Too many people touch my bins. I have a bad habit of not thoroughly washing my hands and touching my face. So for me, it's a no-no. Grease and vegetable oil, um, those will build up in your worm bin and kill your worms. And those don't normally break down, at least in the indoor bin. In the outdoor bin, sure, go for it. Not a problem. Salt, same thing. Salt outside. When it's raining on your bin, it's not a problem. But in your worm bin, salt will build up and kill your worms eventually. And as far as uh, meat and dairy, things like that, those putrefy before the worms can eat them, so you'll have a bad smell. No one likes a stinky worm bin, at least I don't. So that's really kind of what the worms eat. So you can see a lot of things that you produce in your kitchen, you could divert instead of going to you know, the outdoor or green bins outside, they can go into your worm bin. And again, in the summertime, in your outdoor worm bin, or, you know, excuse me, your outdoor compost bin, fine, great, perfect. But in the wintertime, for me, 
my compost pile is way in the corner of my yard. Eh, it's too hard to go out there. I'll just go downstairs. So a lot of things can go in there. Any questions about what the worms can eat? All right, good. So I mentioned I was going to talk a little bit about the worms. So why red wigglers? Um, so these are also known as Cinea fatidia, the red wiggler, red worm, manure worm. Um, they're really good for indoor composting. A couple of things. First of all, they tolerate a reasonable temperature. You don't have to refrigerate your bin or keep it hot. It has to be between 40 and 90 degrees, ideally 65 to 75. So the same temperature range where we're comfortable. Below 40 degrees, remember the worms, they don't have teeth, they don't have a beak. So they're not able to eat the food itself. Once the food starts to break down, that's when they can eat it. So once the food starts to get nasty and make that bad smell, that's when the worms eat it, which is why uh, a well-maintained worm bin doesn't have a bad smell because our food, when we put it in the worm bin, doesn't have a bad smell. It smells like food. Once it starts to break down, that's when you're going to have those off smells, but that's just the time the worms can eat it. So between 40 and 90 degrees, below 40 degrees, that decomposition process slows down, like refrigeration. Their food supply goes away. The worms will die. Above 90 degrees, Mark mentioned hot composting, all the bacteria and everything else is cooking in there, it'll cook the worms. So 40 and 90, ideally 65 to 75. And remember, we're talking soil temperatures, not air temperatures. So all my worm bin, all of them are down in the basement. If you have one, keep it someplace where it's, you know, 65 to 75. Soil temperatures will be a little warmer than air temps. Remember, th as things are breaking down, they're generating heat just like in your outdoor pile. Hopefully not too much for your worm bin. If you're not certain, if you've got a worm bin in a new location, not sure if it's going to be happy, just pop a soil thermometer in there and see. 65 to 75, things are good. So other traits for the worms. They don't like light. They won't escape. Um, they consume food at a good, pretty good rate. They eat about half the food you're putting in there per week. So if you're, if you're starting with a pound of worms, you should put about half a pound of food in there, and then they will multiply to eventually reproduce to be enough that, to accommodate what you're getting, and I can go into that process in more detail later. Um, they're tolerant of handling, so they don't, build, they don't build a permanent burrow that you disrupt by mixing, so I can go in here, mix up my worm bin, I'm not gonna, not gonna destroy their homes, they'll just go someplace else. And they also tolerate a wide range of food types, as I showed in the last slide. So you do have to be cautious in putting certain things in there, citrus, onions, leeks, things like that. I always recommend you feed in the corners, so if there's something in there the pH changes or something in there um, they're not happy with, they can move someplace else. Once that food starts to break down, they'll come back. So always feeding in the corners. Any questions about red wigglers? There are other worms you can use for vermicomposting. These guys, again, keep it simple, stupid. I know I can do this. These guys work great. Question? I put it in the corner, yeah. That's a good question. Yeah, it's always, my recommendation is always food in the bottom, worm is on top of the food, newspaper to cover. So if I were feeding these guys, I'd pop the top off, move the newspaper layer back, move the worms back, do some, some of these. So just move the newspaper back, move the worms back, food, cover it back up with the worms, and then cover it back up with the newspaper. Yeah, and just like Mark mentioned, what I'm doing there is I'm essentially taking my fresh food, clean food, if you will, and I'm inoculating it with all those bacteria and microorganisms. The secret is it's not just worms in this bin, right? It wouldn't work unless I had all the other organisms in there that are helping the food to break down. And by, by putting the food in the bottom and covering with the worms, I'm infecting, if you will, that food and helping it break down more quickly. That's a good question. Any other questions? On? All right, so I'm moving on. So I mentioned they multiply, they reproduce, they reproduce a lot. Um, so they'll typically double a number every 10 to 12 weeks, and their reproduction rate is governed by three things. They're a simple organism, space, temperature, and food supply. If at any point your worm bin is lacking one of those things, they'll stop reproducing, and you'll see that. If you're feeding your worms and it's a brand new bin, you're keeping it nice and warm, you'll find worm cocoons, which are like little eggs, and those are the little white things you see. That's my hand for scale, so they're pretty small. They look like little onions. Um, you'll find a lot of those in your worm bin. Often where the food's been in there a week or two, they'll come, sense the food, and they'll, they'll reproduce. So you'll never have a situation where your worm bin has, you know, too many worms. If at some point there are too many worms and you're not putting enough food in there, they're 
their population will crash and will come back to where they need to be. Ideally, you want um, your worm bin to have, you know, just enough, just enough worms and just enough space so that the food you eat and the waste you produce can go in your worm bin. And at different times of the year, that might change, right? In the summertime at our house, I'm doing a lot of outdoor composting. Eh, my worm population tends to fall off a bit. Whereas in the wintertime, like right now, everything's going in the worm bin, right? My outdoor compost piles are just starting to heat up. So how do you make a worm bin? Real simple. Um, again, you can buy one online. If you want to do that, I'm not one to stop you. But you can also make it really simply with three things, some glue, plastic storage tote, and some screen. Um, you can vermicompost in a really small p container. You'll find things online, people doing it in shoe boxes and things like that. And yes, I could certainly do that, but I wouldn't recommend you start with that. A really small container, um, like let's say a shoe box or a small storage tote, something smaller than 18 gallons, it's, it's very easy for you to put food in there that the worms don't like or to put some kind of food in there that would cause the conditions to change, either become too dry or too wet, as Mark mentioned, cause it to heat up. Whereas an 18 gallon bin, you can pick this up if you want, plenty heavy, there's a lot of mass there. So for me to change the temperature of this or change the pH of this um, would be very difficult. Also, if I'm always feeding in the corners in a very small container, right, there's not much space for the worms to go. And if worms become unhappy because temperature, pH, or moisture, the only place for them to go is out, which means on your floor. No one wants that. Whereas in a bin this size, if this corner gets too funky for them or too wet for them or too warm for them, you just move to the other corners. There's plenty of food there. They can be happy, and again, once those conditions get back to what they want, they'll go back into that corner and eat the food. So 18-gallon bin, which is like the standard size for a storage tote. People always say, well, can you scale up? Yes, to a point. Right? At some point, this worm bin is going to get full of vermicompost and soil, and those big ones get really heavy. So an 18-gallon bin, um, even when it's six to eight inches deep, which is the maximum for these guys, it's still not, it's still not too heavy. It's reasonable weight. Um, so six to eight inches, I didn't mention that. So because these worms, these Lysinia fatidia, don't build a permanent burrow, right, and they need oxygen and everything else to live, you don't want the, the worm soil, the vermicompost in your worm bin, to be more than six to eight inches deep. If your castings and your food and whatnot is deeper than that, let's say it's 10 or 12 inches, what happens is that those bottom few inches become anaerobic. And Mark talked about that. That's when you start getting off smells. And the reason it becomes anaerobic is because, well, first of all, the oxygen can't go down that far. And that's because the worms won't dig down that far. It's too, too dense for them. And so if you're ever, you know, looking at your worm bin, really, your senses are your best guide for this. So when you go to feed your worms, pop, pop open the lid. Is there moisture on the lid? Is there moisture on the sides? That tells you some, it's too wet. Does it smell funny? Check it out. See what's going on. Likely, if it smells, the smells are off. It's because either something's rotting in there that you're smelling, potatoes, onions, they're often good culprits, or it's becoming anaerobic. And you'll know right away, as soon as you pull the newspaper back, if it's more wet than, just like Mark said, at 50, 55%, if it's more than a wrung out sponge, it's too wet. And that's where you'll start getting those off smells. And the remedy for that is just mix in some newspaper, make it light and fluffy, just as he said. So your, your senses are your best guide. And if you see something weird, check it out. Anyway, back to making the worm bin, sorry. So it's just an 18-gallon storage tote with some holes. I drilled these holes with a um, keyhole bit on my saw, on my drill, like that, just kind of saw holes. They don't have to be round. The worms don't have eyes. They don't care what they look like. <laughs> it just makes it look nice. And then I glued on some screen. You don't have to use screen. You could use landscape fabric, pantyhose, what have you. And you can use, you can use tape, but I recommend a glue that's silicone-based. Um, in case it does get wet, it still sticks and it remains pliable because the worm bin especially if you're putting the holes on the lid. Um, there's a lot of torquing and t tension involved and eventually get, um, get kind of crusty. So duct tape lasts about a year or two. This amazing household goop that you can buy at the Ace lasts more than 10 years. So it's good stuff. But really simple, you can look at that and see immediately how to make one. Um, the bin style I have here has the holes drilled in the sides. Um, I now recommend you do it in the top. Drilling holes in the sides is unstable and dangerous when you're trying to do it. Drilling holes in the top is really easy. It's straight down. Um, the drill won't slip off and hit you in the leg. Um, <laughs> voice of experience there. Don't let that happen. Um, but again, it doesn't really matter where you put the holes as long as they're away from, away from where the worm soil is going to be. 
And starting your bin. I alluded to this earlier. It's really simple. You start with a pound of worms. That's that white container I have there. A pound of worms consumes about a half a pound of food per week. So you take your food in the bottom, worms on top, newspaper to cover, half a pound of food in the first corner, dump it all in, dump all the worms on top of it, and fill it up with dry shredded newspaper. Next week, we have a pointer here. Yeah, right in the middle of the green thing. No, no, on, your, on the advancer. There's a, there's a green bar in the middle. No, take the slide advancer. Yeah. Oh, this one. Yeah, and right on top. There. I got you. Green thing there. Thank yeah. you. Right on. So this is corner number one. We fed this week our half a pound of food. Corner number two is next week, a half a pound of food. Following week, corner number three, another half a pound of food. Corner number four, half a pound of food. All right. So now we've gone around a full rotation of our worm bin one time. We're back to our original corner, put in three quarters of a pound of food as opposed to the first half a pound of food. Do that the next four weeks. We come back to our original corner. It's now been week eight going into week nine, keeping our worm bin in our house where it's nice and warm, plenty of space in a brand new bin, and we're feeding our worms. That original pound of worms should now double in number and be two pounds of worms, right? They're going to double in number every 10 to 12 weeks. So back to our original corner, put in a pound of food. You should have two pounds of worms in there. And again, your senses are your guide to vermicomposting. If you come back to your original corner, it's week eight, and there aren't many worms, and there's a lot of food, there's a problem. Mm. Likely your worm bin is too cool. Um, and just like outdoor composting, food breaks down based on heat. So if things are looking weird, grab your soil thermometer, pop in your worm bin, see what's going on. It's probably because the soil temps are 50 degrees, and it's, you know, you're calling me, it's January. Why is my worm bin so cold? Well, it's in your basement, it's 50 degrees. Get it up off the cement, it'll go a little bit quicker. Um, likewise, it's August and you call me, my worm bin is kind of stinky and what's going on? Well, how's your newspaper look? Is your newspaper that's on top of your worm soil, is it a you know, nice dry layer and then a little bit of moist stuff below it on top of the worm soil? That's what you want. If it's all that moist mess, it's too, dry, it's too wet and you need to dry it out. Put some dry shredded newspaper on there. Last thing is getting the vermicompost out. It's not quite as simple as just uh, opening up your earth machine and digging, digging what you want out of there. You want to separate the worms who are your, you know, they're your workers from the vermicompost. And there are a couple different ways to do it. Um, the method that I found works best is to use the sun as your helper. As I mentioned, I and fatidia are afraid of the light. So on a bright sunny day when it's above 60 degrees, take your worm bin outside, open up a garbage can or a uh, garbage can, a garbage bag or a tarp and make like a nice pyramid out of the soil. Walk away for a few minutes, the sun will hit that drive all the worms into the soil and just scoop off the top layer of soil. And keep doing that, you would be chasing the worms down. As you go, whoops, as you go through the process, you will find scraps of food that they haven't fully eaten. Um, things like um, broccoli stalks, pits, things that take a long time to break down. Drop those back into your, use my clean hands, drop those back into your collection container to go back in the worm bin. And here I was just taking the vermicompost and putting it through a quarter inch cloth hardware, hardware cloth sieve because I was going to try to make some nice, nice vermicompost out of it. And to restart your, restart your worm bin, you take what's in here, dump that on top of the food, add up some shredded newspaper, and you're back to the races again. So, more information. Yes? No, the food we eat is so wet. You might find if you've got a new bin and it's, you know, let's say a couple months old, let's say you got it for Christmas and it's the end of January when our homes are very, very dry and we're trying to humidify, it's the only time of year you might, um, but it's rare. It, what would be better is if you find that your worm bin is too dry, clean out your crisper, <laughs> put those wet veggies in there. Um, quite often, instead of combating too dry, you're combating too wet. Every time I food, every time I feed my worms, every time I add my food, I'm adding more dry shredded newspaper. Um, and it's got to be, if, it, if you use newspaper, it's got to be the, it can be colored pages, that's not a big deal, but it can't be the glossy pages. It's got to be just the regular newsprint. Anyway, tons more information on my website. Um, if I was too quick on the directions for anything, um, feel free to send me an email. Um, I love talking about it, so. And I've got the worm in here to check out after we're all done. Thank you.
point is right here. That green thing. Right. Cool. So good evening everybody. Uh, thanks again for coming out tonight. Um, there's some saying about 90% uh, of success in life is showing up and I just want to thank you for showing up tonight. Um, thank the Conservation Committee as well for uh, hosting us all um, and the, my fellow presenters for educating me tonight uh, along with you. I feel like we probably know now more than 99% of the, the world's population about composting, so that's kind of cool. Um, so here's my backyard pile. I'm sort of the, uh, the lazy, unesthetic uh, composter, as you can see here. Uh, but this method works as well. It's just a big pile and, and a pitchfork and some um, back muscle, basically. Um, so the natural question at this point that you're probably asking yourselves is, what are we going to be doing with all of this compost that we're going to be creating, right? Um, and I have some different answers to that question. Um, firstly, we're going to be able to recreate, reconnect, I should say, with our agricultural roots. Um, we weren't around to sort of experience this, but Scarborough used to be a very agricultural place. Um, and it's heading back in that direction, I'm happy to say. Um, so I'm just going to show a couple of slides of Scarborough's agricultural past here. Um, and we produced a lot of food along the way. Um, and we have the potential to produce a lot of food again, um, especially if we're growing our own fertility, uh, which is what composting is, of course. Uh, I want to show you my backyard about 130 years ago. Um, this was the site of the Scarborough Cape Elizabeth Agricultural Fair. Um, so Scarborough was sort of the epicenter regionally of agriculture back in the, uh, the late 19th century. People would travel um, half a day on horseback to come to uh, Pleasant Hill to learn about agriculture. Um, fast forward 130 years. Uh, here is the Scarborough Agricultural Fairgrounds now, otherwise known as the Pleasant Hill neighborhood. <laughs> um, that red dot is actually my house. Um, so just to situate people here, we're looking at the neighborhood which pretty much is in between um, the Volunteer Fire Station and Pleasant Hill School. Um, so what I've sort of seen as one of my jobs um, is to try to turn that fairgrounds back into a productive fairgrounds. Um, and if we were to sort of zoom in a little bit more um, from this image here and look in people's backyards, we'd see a lot of yards like this. And this is in fact my yard when I moved in in 2005. Um, so it's not exactly an agricultural landscape per se, um, unless you're a grass farmer or a sheep. Um, <laughs> and so this is what we've turned it into over time, um, which is a very productive agricultural landscape. That's about 1,500 square feet um, of very productive land. Um, and my wife, who has a master's degree in economics, at one point um, pointed out to me that I needed to do a better job of pointing out just how productive um, a backyard garden can be financially speaking. And so we did some quick math. Um, that's a cute photo. I actually took that. Um, I think that's the best photo I've ever taken. Um, so we did some quick math over the course of a growing season to figure out just how much um, economic value we were able to generate uh, via our backyard garden. And my wife, being the economist in the family, um, was able to come up with a very impressive spreadsheet. Um, you don't need to see the details here, uh, but the bottom line is actually down here. And we figured out by actually weighing everything that came out of our garden over the course of, yes, six months, um, including everything from strawberries to potatoes to salad greens to herbs, that we had saved $2,000 by growing our own food. And we did the math in terms of figuring out what the um, sort of the replacement costs would have been for us had we needed to buy 
all of those potatoes, strawberries, salad greens, herbs from different places, either a place like Hannaford or um, a, a farmer's market or sort of like an upscale grocery place like um, Whole Foods. So those are the different price sets that you see down here. And the amount that we saved depends on where we would have shopped for those things. So we're talking about a pretty uh, nice chunk of change there, $2,000 that we didn't have to um, give to somebody else. Um, so that's sort of cool. And so we also have a, a garden in our front yard. Um, this is a, a picture of me heroically uh, harvesting some potatoes for my front yard garden. Um, and so my neighbors tend to see me here because it's in our front yard. Um, and it's mentioned, I think, in the, the papers, but I work for a gardening organization, a nonprofit organization called Kitchen Gardeners International. Um, we're a network of about 35,000 gardeners from 120 countries. Um, we're growing some of our own food and we're helping other people to do the same thing. Um, so my neighbors, they tend to see me like this as a home gardener and as a gardening advocate, um, but this is actually how I see myself. <laughs> um, sort of a garden evangelist, <laughs> preaching the good news about gardens to anybody who will listen to me. Uh, but in fact, I don't really think of myself as an evangelist because I know an evangelist is sort of channeling higher powers and um, divine inspiration and all that stuff. So I think of myself actually as being a little bit more of a garden propagandist, <laughs> um, using, using creative persuasion as opposed to divine inspiration. And I'm a bit of a student of propaganda campaigns. I love this one from the late 1930s. We've seen this um, more recently as well. This was um, produced in Britain at the time of the war uh, to get people to kind of calm down and go on with life. Um, this is probably the, the more um, appropriate version for us right now because it seems like there's always something that we need to worry about, right? Um, there's always some sort of crisis on the near horizon if it's not climate change, it's uh, Zika, if it's not Zika, it's ISIS, and depending on where you stand politically, if it's not ISIS, it's a Donald Trump presidency. Um, but there really are some pretty serious issues out there that we need to be concerned with, and this is one of the graphs that sort of keeps me up at night. We have a world population now of about 7.4 billion, and um, we're on our way to over 11 billion people by the end of this century. Um, so that's going to represent an over 50% increase in the global population over the next 85 years, which is a really serious challenge. Um, so I can understand why we might want to sort of console ourselves or seek comfort in a cold beverage <laughs> or look to the skies for some help. <laughs> Uh, but the, the truth is that this is really what we have to work with. And the, although the world population is going to be increasing by 50% in the next 85 years, we're not going to be increasing our natural resource base by 50% during that same period of time. Uh, so we do need to live within the, the limits of planet Earth. Fortunately, those limits are actually quite generous if we figure it out. And one way of thinking of these limits that I think is sort of helpful is to think of planet Earth as planet Apple. Um, in terms of its agricultural capacity, um, so instead of thinking in terms of um, planet Earth, let's think of it as an apple. And let's already remove three quarters of that apple uh, because it's already covered with water of some sort. So in terms of agricultural production capacity, that's not going to be very helpful for us. So we're now down to a quarter of our apple for feeding that growing global population. Uh, but there too, that's not all available to us uh, because a lot of that, half of that, is actually covered with um, things like mountains and deserts and ice, um, not very good for farming. So now we're down to one eighth. And that one eighth has some compromised lands, um, developed lands. Um, lands not unlike the lands that we're on here in, in Oak Hill in that they're covered with roads and they're covered with parking lots and they tend to have poor soils um, and the rest is cropland. So let's just for the sake of argument take the developed lands um, out of the picture for the time being. We're now down to 1 32nd um, of the planet available for agricultural purposes. 
Uh, but there too, we're not talking about that full volume of that segment that's available in the way that an apple would um, sort of allow for. We're really just talking about the thin skin on the apple. Um, and that is, of course, the topsoil. That's what's available for agricultural production. Now, if we add a little bit of climate change and extreme weather to that, um, it doesn't leave us feeling very inspired about our ability to meet this enormous challenge of feeding all of these people over the course of the next 85 years. So a new approach is needed, I think, and it, that approach involves you know, bringing those developed lands back into the equation. Um, and what has happened over time, especially after World War II, is there's been sort of a division between um, where the crops grow and where the pops grow, <laughs> the people, the cropland and the popland. And one of the great trends that's happened over the course of uh, many of our lifetimes has been this increasing distancing between where the crops are produced and where the people live. Uh, to the point now where the average biteful of food in the United States travels something like 1,500 miles from field to fork or plot to plate. Um, so to put that in perspective here, it's a little bit like having all of Maine's food grown in Texas and trucked up. Um, clearly that's not good for the planet and that's not good for the people either and it's certainly not good for the food. If you, if you want to have um, fresh produce, you don't want to have it grown in Texas. So we need a new approach and I think the new approach that um, we need to be in exploring more and more is one that brings crops and people back together again. And it's uh, a, an approach known as edible landscaping. And I um, normally give a longer talk where I sort of take people around the world to a few different places that I think have done some really inspiring things with um, edible landscaping. Um, because our time is a little bit tight tonight, I'm only going to take you to northern England, uh, to a little town called Todmorden which um, has a population of about 16,000 people, so it's not so different from Scarborough in terms of the population. And Todd is, is an interesting place. Um, it is uh, a former mill town, industrial town, um, which really enjoyed great prosperity uh, during the Industrial Revolution. They produced a lot of textiles there. Um, jobs were readily available. Um, the town grew very, very quickly, and um, what happened, of course, like so many different mill towns, whether they're in England or in the United States, um, after the Industrial Revolution, um, mill towns went into decline um, when industrial production traveled to other parts of the globe. And that happened in Todmorden as well, and Todmorden went into decline, and jobs were lost, and um, the town really began to sort of lose its sense of identity as well. Um, they were seeing um, crime rising, they were seeing people um, becoming um, addicted to different substances, and as I said before, the town was losing its identity as a place where things were, were produced. Um, in stopped, stepped a couple of uh, very inspiring uh, women who said, you know what, we're going to make Todmorden famous again for producing something. Um, and they said, you know, what's the, the most useful thing that we could produce as a town? And of course the answer is food, uh, yeah. because we need to, you know, all eat in order to survive. And so they went about this uh, very uh, inspiring project uh, called the Incredible Edible, where they just started to plant gardens um, in public spaces in town, and their motto was that it's easier to ask for uh, forgiveness than it is permission. Um, a great motto to live by, by the way. Um, so they didn't ask permission. They just started planting um, edible gardens here, there, and everywhere. And their, their theme was that they were planting not just for themselves. They were planting gardens that were available for people who could benefit from them. Um, so their, their motto was also sort of food to share and every public garden that they planted was harvestable by, by anyone in town. And so little by little, this idea caught on, um, and they, of course, involved their schools um, and quickly got all the schools on board. And it wasn't there uh, long after that the schools became involved that the police station said, hey, we've got a little bit of land right in front of our headquarters. We can get involved as well. 
And of course, once the police station got involved, the fire station had to get on board too. <laughs> and they started planting fruit and nut trees on their land. And it was at that point that things got a little bit out of control in Todd Merton. <laughs> they were actually starting to run out of um, available public spaces to grow all of these gardens. And it was at that point that someone discovered a really fertile patch of ground in town. Um, <laughs> okay. Seems like people are, are questioning um, whether or not we should go there or not. <laughs> But um, what did happen over time was they discovered that um, a three years or so into their project, they had managed to plant 40 public gardens, so many public gardens that they actually needed to create a map to remember where they were all located and to help direct people to them because suddenly they had a flock of tourists, uh, garden and farm tourists, interested in what was growing on in Todmorden. Um, and the tourists included everything from the, the noblest of gentlemen farmers, uh, like Prince Charles coming to check out sort of the annual fair that they organize each year, uh, to the, the lowliest of garden peasants who just uh, <laughs> wanted to see it up close for himself. Uh, but I share that story with you just because it all started with a small group of people who said, we're going to do something. We're actually going to show up. We're going to... Um, take some initiative and focus on one issue in particular that concerns us and see if we can build some momentum around that. Um, so my question, keeping in mind the Scarborough Fairgrounds from the past, you know, how do we get to Scarborough Fair? How do we get to more local foods being produced here in Scarborough? Because um, as I said before, at the outset of my talk, you know, we have all of this compost. We need to do something with it, right? Well, clearly, um, the way to Scarborough Fair is through more farms and more gardens. Um, and there's some great work being done here in town on both of those fronts. I'm not really going to talk about the farms, uh, but I will just point out that that's a picture of the Broad Turn Farm. Uh, if people haven't been out to the Broad Turn Farm to visit it, um, it's a very inspiring place in its own right. Um, hats off to the the Scarborough Land Trust for leading the way in terms of protecting that land and um, being such good stewards of the land along with uh, uh, John and Stacy, the, the farmers over there. Uh, this picture from below is actually not of Scarborough, but I included it just because I think it's such an amazing picture of a community garden. Uh, just seeing all those people in that garden setting, thinking about all of the different types of conversations that are probably happening there all of the education that is probably going on in a setting like that. Uh, we clearly need more of that um, in Scarborough. And, and my organization is working on that uh, to the extent that you know, we can focus uh, on Scarborough. We try to, but there's a whole world of, of gardeners out there that we're trying to sort of service. Uh, but I did want to just point out a couple of things happening here in town. Um, we would certainly love to see more people looking at their backyards in the way that we initially looked at our backyard when we first, first moved in, which is, you know, instead of thinking of it just as a lawn, you know, let's think of it as a backyard produce section. Um, and that's certainly how my family and I look at our backyard, you know, not just for a couple of months of the year, but really something more like four or five months where we're actually getting a lot of uh, vegetables out of our backyard. Um, community gardens, there is a, a sort of community garden um, slash pantry, food pantry garden. Um, just down the road here at St. Nick's, um, which is in very, very good hands with uh, some volunteers there where the food is being donated to um, the Scarborough Food Pantry. Uh, this picture down in the lower left-hand corner is of the new Wentworth School Garden, um, which is a, a wonderful garden, I think a very uh, good example of what a school garden can be. Um, once again, it's because there, there's a group of uh, teachers and administrators and parents who are making that happen. I wanted to include one last space in here because I know that a lot of people have their eyes on this patch of land where the old water tower used to be. And there, I'm, I'm sure we're going to come up with a great idea for what should be done there. Uh, but I'll just throw one um, into the mix, which is, you know, to the extent that we can sort of make that land healthy again, I don't know what type of heavy metals might be in it as a result of having had the water tower and lead paint 
on that water tower. Uh, but I would love to see it used for some sort of a, a community garden or a senior garden uh, with some connection to the high school. Um, so that's just something for us to be thinking about a little bit. Uh, the work that my organization is focusing on at the moment, it's, it's a program called Seed Money. I just wanted to give it a quick plug. Um, it's what we call a crowd grants program. Um, so we offer um, funding but also fundraising tools to a broad range of different types of garden projects, uh, like a couple of the ones that you just saw there. Uh, we gave a grant to the St. Nick's uh, project. We gave a, a couple of grants to the Wentworth Garden, a, a recent grant to the high school, uh, to all the elementary schools. And um, we're, we're very excited to you know, support as many projects locally as we possibly can. Um, over the past three years, we've managed to to fund um, 800 gardens in 30 countries, uh, reaching a bunch of people and uh, growing a lot of food along the way. So, you know, thinking once again about these challenges that we face, you know, feeding all of these millions and millions of people, you know, I really do think that we're up to that challenge, you know, if we can do this, if we can keep calm and garden on. Um, but I've learned the, the hard way that it's always good to have a backup plan in life and so if it really comes down to it, well, we can always grab a beer and call Batman. <laughs> Thanks very much. Not as much time as you might think. I think there was a, a period of time where I was seeing myself as that heroic gardener who was really trying to put a lot of time into getting everything just right. And then I had children, um, and then they started playing soccer. Um, <laughs> and um, so now I think I'm in a different phase of my life, which is I certainly love spending time in the garden. I, I, I find a certain peace there that I, I don't find in, in other pursuits. Um, so I'd be very happy to spend more time there, but I'm sort of evolving in my techniques where um, mulch has become my best friend, I think, yeah. um, where I'm figuring out ways to really keep the, um, some of the bad jobs down to a minimum so that I can focus more on the things that are, are a lot of fun for me. But I really, I don't have a good estimate about the, you know, the number of minutes or hours um, and I think that speaks to, you know, just how much I enjoy it, because when you're enjoying something, you're really not sort of counting the, the minutes. <laughs> I don't know of one. I'm not sure if you guys or you yeah. folks have heard of something like that. Yeah. You base it on a soil test, and you base it on an analysis of the compost. So you'll get a recommendation from, for example, the University of Maine Soil Testing Lab in Orono. You take a soil test and they say you need this much uh, nitrogen, this much phosphorus, this much uh, potassium, and then you compare what the compost has to offer, and then you apply it at that rate. I, w I will tell you that with compost, you can't apply it as a fertilizer because you have to add so much of it because it's so low in, in the major nutrients that you would end up having just straight compost to plant in. So what we do instead is we put the compost down to, to make the soil more receptive of nutrients and then we apply a fertilizer source knowing that that fertilizer will stay available for the plants longer than in the straight soil. Uh, it can be, uh, I, I try to stay away from the chemical fertilizers, not that I'm against any of the companies. I just like the natural things we produce every day. Uh, so I would go with my manures first. If you can't get natural manures, then you can look at other sources, but basically the compost helps to benefit that. So is it a complete fertilizer thing or is it like bone meal and, you know? Bone meal works great. Uh, blood stuff. too. Blood's a big yeah. one. We have a, a huge slaughter industry that slaughters animals and, and deer, things like that, and blood meal is an incredible nitrogen source. It's very, very high. I actually will add it to a compost pile if it's, if it's not doing a good job. You hit it with a blast of blood meal and it will take right off. By the way, too, before I forget, if anybody wants uh, copies of my handouts, we don't, the DEP, we don't burn a lot of paper, so I actually have them on that computer as electronic copies. So if you ask for it, they can email it to you, and there are three slides per page. So you can take a look at them. Thank you. 
if you want to. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I didn't get into that. So just like just like how I start people, you're essentially inoculating a worm bin. So you get a container about that size <laughs> of the worm soil. So move the newspaper back and scoop right out of a place where they've, like, like maybe uh, you haven't fed there in like three or four weeks. So there's lots of worms to food. Um, and that would start their worm bin. And they would do the same thing. They put half that volume of food in the first corner, dump all those worms on top, dry shred a newspaper, and they're going. Okay, Mark, tell them how many worms you have in there. <laughs> <laughs> Too many. <laughs> Twenty some. <laughs> but I'm, but I'm, you don't, you don't need that. Um, when we were, so when my daughter was young, and before we started Romania ten years ago, we were, um, we had two bins, maybe three, two or three. Yep. Okay, I can't remember. I can't. I know we needed more than one. We eat a lot of vegetables though. So, um, but now my wife is very tolerant and allows me to sell worms. And to sell them, you need a lot more, um, just because I don't want to. I don't want to give people a container with not enough worms in it. I want to give them something that's going to work. Um, she's very patient. Yes. Yeah, I import food from Lois. <laughs> yeah, that's a whole separate thing. It's a whole separate conversation. You won't be doing that probably. What's that, Deb? I have to make fun of you. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> this gentleman over there has a question. Yes, indeed. Yeah, I just have a question. I know none of you are specifically representing the uh, Scarborough Publishing Program, but in that it says that you they will accept meat, bones, dairy, but the hand out for backyard compost and say not to use that. Is that because the Scarborough Collection is using a different method of composting, or what's the... Uh, yes and yes. It basically, the larger the pile, the more stuff you can add, because when you have a home compost bin that's fairly small, if you put meat in, when it goes rancid, it becomes very odorous, and then it attracts scavenging animals. And the idea is that you don't want somebody that's composting at home to start attracting rats and raccoons and skunks because then it, it gives them a very bad feeling about composting. So we set you up with stuff that's going to make you succeed. The eggshells, the coffee grounds, things that don't produce a lot of odor but give a big bang for their buck in the compost pile. But when you have a pile that's 5, 10 cubic yards in size, you, we've, we've actually, in a 10 cubic yard pile, I got rid of a whole Holstein cow that died of natural causes. In eight weeks, it was down to the skeleton. So we use it as mortality management. So it, it can be done. Thank you. Uh, a lot of the uh, literature again, gathering is always uh, recommending well composted manure. So the well composted manure is now compost. And you're saying you would just prefer to add compost instead of add fertilizer. If you refer to the Sure. Let me let me give an example. You take straight chicken manure. It's roughly three to four percent nitrogen. Excellent fertilizer source. Then you add two parts carbon to the one part chicken manure and you let it compost for eight weeks. Now you have a half a percent nitrogen. So you've gone from a fertilizer source to a source that's not a strong fertilizer but has other value. The organic matter that comes from the compost that you put into the soil makes the soil that much better at holding on to nutrients. So you can definitely use compost as a fertilizer source, but it, you don't get it the first year. You don't get it the second year. You may get it the third year. Because what happens is that when those humic compounds are formed, they're what we call recalcitrant, which means that they break down very, very, very slowly. It's like putting your money in the bank and then taking out only small bits. <coughs> That's how compost gives you nutrients. When you're growing something like corn, you need 150 pounds of nitrogen right then and now. Compost is not going to do it for you. That's, that's sort of what I mean by it's not a fertilizer source. It's more of a soil conditioner.
Awesome. That's great. So it's working. Um, uh, I don't have big holes. It's little holes. And sometimes they're, they kind of like to crawl out. So I've gotten into the habit of putting a light on. Yeah, and, perfect. Um, now, is that okay? Yeah. Because keep a light on all the time. I'm going to go home and just make sure that it's, you know, a little sweet test and everything. Another question is, um, okay, so if you take some of if you take some of them in the garden and you have eggs in there, they're basically in, you know like exotic. They're <laughs> they're not actually native. Absolutely. But that's okay, correct? Yeah, because when we're talking about are the eggs are the are the worms going to live outside? Not over the winter. If they were in a large outside yeah. hot compost pile, they could survive. But as soon as that soil temperature goes below 40 degrees, their food supply goes away. They can tolerate that for a while. But once the soil freezes, and right now our frost, our frost line is measured in feet, these guys don't dig more than six to eight inches in the soil, mm -hmm. they're dead in the winter. Now in a large hot pile, yes, which is why, which is why these guys, the Icinia fetidia, I say these guys, I mean the worms. Um, the Icinia fetidia are known as manure worms because in a large manure pile, um, they can survive over winter. If it stays warm enough, they can find that, you know, that, um, that place where it's not too hot, right. not too mm -hmm. cold, not too deep, they can find that layer where they'll survive. Which is why on old horse farms and pig farms, you can sometimes find Icenia fetinia. Are they native? God knows where they came from. Um, but they won't survive. They won't typically survive in the yard outside, no. And what about seaweed in that bin? Yes, with no, the salt caveat. So yes, but you I, I would rinse it first. Okay. I'd probably stick, I'd prefer to stick that seaweed in my outdoor bin as opposed to my worm bin. Just because if you have too much salt in there, you'll see it. it, it it'll, the worm bin will be going along fine, and all of a sudden, bang, yeah. salt, salt concentration is too high, and they'll all just die. And what do you know about fungus To be avoided. That's what I know about them. <laughs> to be avoided. Yeah. The biggest, the biggest thing about keeping, um, keeping things like fungus gnats and fruit flies out of your worm bin are your collection container, like this one, something with a tight-fitting lid that you keep closed. And um, I, I mentioned earlier, your senses are your best guide to vermicomposting. If when you go down to feed your worms, you take the top off this container and look in there, and anything is moving, flying, or crawling, the top goes back and then it goes outside. Um, you don't, you don't, what's that, Devin? Or in the freezer. Yeah, the freezer would work too. That will absolutely kill those things, definitely. Yeah. <coughs> Do you have fungus gnats or fruit flies dorm in right now? Uh, well, let's yeah. talk afterwards. I got okay. I can help yeah. you. Mark, you want to address that? How does that thing work? This is a question. The, it's not the best, but what what people like about it is that it's very aesthetic. And 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 incidentally, not to interrupt Mr. King, it's what the town sells. Well, we're selling these at cost. If, if you're <coughs> Basically, though, the way that it's supposed to work, and this can be frustrating to people, is that you put your food and your amendments, which would be horse manure, weeds, or other carbon sources, and so you put a layer of that down, a layer of food, and you keep layering, and then as it starts to get full, if you want to make compost faster, and you take a pitchfork and you start turning it and mixing. The problem that I have with these is that there's not enough holes. I tell people when they get these to grow a lot more holes because the compost needs oxygen. When it needs it, it needs it. And oftentimes, if it doesn't get it, it will just stop working. And these also, because they're kind of stuck and <coughs> freezing in the wintertime, the only thing that helps them is the sun will keep the black plastic. But they're just, I'd much rather use the, the logs to trap wire. It's wide open, there's air flowing everywhere, and it makes really great compost. <coughs> Being somewhat impatient and trying to minimize the time between the adding of the food and getting compost, 
how smart or how stupid would I be by adding some of those products that we use for septic uh, right? Okay. Yeah, yeah. To create the break down the solids? I will tell you that, that I used to have a compost pile for pet waste at my house, but you know the kids got around it and so I started to get worried. So what I do now is I use a metal trash can, I cut the bottom out of it, I dug a hole in the ground, and I stuck the can on top, and then what I do is I add the pet waste against the soil. The natural soil microbes feed on it, and every so often I give it a little Ridex, or I give it a little yeast with warm water, or I used to make home beer, and I pour the word out in there, and it breaks it all down in, into the soil. So can you add compost additives? Absolutely. If you're making your layers right, you don't need to, but some people want to see more action. So I say get a bag of dehydrated cow manure, five-gallon pail of good warm water, and dump a clump of that in there, and it makes a manure tea, and you pour that all over your compost, and it'll kickstart it. That, that's that's a lot cheaper than buying some of these additives. These additives are like fifteen twenty dollars. Bag of dehydrated cow manure is two fifty. Yep, it'll 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 help a lot. Yep. At least for vermicomposting, I can answer that question. Yes, um, and you want to be particularly attentive to old newspaper, um, things that if you're cleaning out an attic and you find newspaper from the 40s, 50s, things like that, don't put those in your compost bin. Send those for recycling. Um, there was also some um, reports on the uh, worm internet about um, yellow um, bubble jet ink containing cadmium. This is, God, this is my five or six years ago. Um, I haven't seen anything about that. If you don't know, call the manufacturer. They're happy to tell you we're using safe, organically based yep. the ink. Give, give them a call. That's a very good question, though. But black is all right. Yeah, black is all right. And I use yep. the press herald, too. Um, okay. Perfectly fine. I use Advanta ink. And I don't know if Nancy told us to tell people this, but over the library, do you know which of the new papers that come in use which kinds of ink? Just to let her know ahead of time. She'll say it's on the side for you. That's great. I just wanted to say something to the gentleman about who was asking about fertilizer and composting. Um, I don't know if he's over there. Okay. <laughs> um, for instance, in permaculture, the goal is a closed loop system. So, uh, if particularly if you have animals on the property, the goal is not to have to bring inputs into your property. That's very hard to achieve with a small property, or you can do trading. But um, it is something that is achievable and is the goal of um, permaculture and other types of organic gardening. So the ultimate goal is not to have to bring in other inputs. Um, and if you uh, check out the, the movie I mentioned called Sonatas of the Soil, there's a farm with a couple, I'm not sure what state they're in, but they're, you can just see their faces glowing and they're just so excited that their farm is taken care of fully by composting. And of course, it's essential to put all the proper nutrients into the compost, um, but they seem to achieve it, and it's very exciting. It's something to look into. You know, maybe you can achieve some sort of closed-loop system, if not within your own property, by sharing and trading trading ingredients. Absolutely. I, did, I didn't get a chance to say either. We actually use compost in another more, I think, awesome way, and that is that out in Indiana this, this past January, we had a big bout of uh, avian influenza. It ended up killing 600,000 turkeys. Mm -hmm. And myself and several members of the main compost team went out there to assist them in, in helping to get rid of the mortalities. And we composted all of those mortalities, every single one. Mm -hmm. And the end result was we not only killed the virus, but they're using that compost on their crops in the spring. So it's 100% full circle, and that's really what my take home message from this whole thing is, is that I want you to compost nutrients locally because to me if you generate those nutrients in town and you compost them in town and you use them in town, that's 100% full cycle and, and I want to see that as much as possible because our soils are suffering and why should we bring in nutrients from other states when we should be making our own and, and dealing with it right at home. So that's what I'd like to help do. What happens is that when the animals die, when this disease hits a farm, 
everything is considered infected. So all the feed, all the manure, all the birds, and we had to blend them with something because it was the middle of the winter, these birds were frozen. And so what we did is we went to a bark mulch company that made compost. And they had some very hot bark mulch, and we brought that onto the farm, and we used that as part of the recipe. And we let these piles sit for 14 days, and we had to achieve hot temperatures to kill the pathogen. Then we turned it, then they had another 14 days. And at the end of 28 days, these people were able to get back to their lives and repopulate their farms. So it was really, it was, it was a pleasure to be there, but it was really tragic to see the devastation. To the, uh, all these birds were one week away from being sold. When, when the virus hit. They were up to full market weight and they, and they would have gone, gone to auction in a week and the disease hit and every single one had to be put down. So it just shows you that, I'm not saying that compost cures everything, but as Batman does, so does compost. <laughs> Good to have something on your side, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Good. Good, well, thank you very much. I guess that's our program. All right. Good. Beautiful job, my friend. That was awesome. I'll be in touch with you with yeah, the information on that. Yeah. And maybe it'll be something that, that you might find valuable. I'm up for sure. Cool. All right. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you for this. Really good. Thank you.